Katie Lee, thank you so much for your time tonight. Uh, obviously your first time at Chalk Valley. How is it to be here? Well, it's the most wonderful place to come. You come round the road, you look down from the little green hills over there. It looks like um, a setting for medieval knights, with little pointy tents and very, very pretty little place. And you think, wow, what a festival. Wonderful here. Yeah. And a great audience as well. Uh, you can always tell when you get up, you know, in a tent and you think, hmm, yes. Are they going to stare out because it's been such a warm day? Are they going to spend the time staring <laughs> out that way? No, they're all looking at you and you think, oh, thank you. Two things worry me. Is anybody in the audience taking notes? You know, going, you know, I'm going to pick her up on this later. Yeah. And then the, occasionally you get, when you're talking about a historical subject, um, you get and you think, oh gosh, there's, there's a, a great egghead there who's, when you say something, is going, <laughs> you spot them out you're not asking a question but it's fun to do and uh, I am talking about a very serious subject mm. which is World War I but on the other hand looking at the progress that women made and their mm. achievements during that war it is actually a great story and I think it's a very heartening one even though it's against this very very difficult grim background it's one of the stories where you have to say actually good came of it yeah I mean why do you think we still wholly underestimate the role that women play in, in World War One? Well, history is on the whole, you know, written by men, and men have mm. been in charge. When you look at uh, going back to ancient history, you are looking at a patriarchal world mm. and one in which women often didn't even have the means to um, get any kind of power unless they were born to it, perhaps. Uh, nor did they get the means to write about it. And mm. so you have um, an unsung story, probably, and there's probably marvellous things which have happened, but which were never recorded. By the time you come to the 20th century, you are looking, though, at a more educated nation. Mm -hmm. And um, most of the women, even those who went into the factories to make munitions and those who went to work on the land, could read and write. Mm. That was the great sort of um, step forward in the late 1800s. So you've got women who can express themselves. And we've got marvellous letters and diaries and descriptions of what those women did what in the war doing. and I think that starts to bring it alive. But what I found was staggering with someone like Flora Sands who you know was the only woman to, to serve is almost you know all but forgotten. Again some, I, well it's, it's it's difficult to analyze this there were a yeah. great number of women who were immensely prominent during World War One and quite a lot of them wrote books afterwards mm. uh, their memoirs and they make for great reading and then they've fade from view and I suppose the argument is that the First World War was such a momentous and dreadful war which left a huge legacy of injury, of grieving, of sorrow and of men who never spoke about it. And afterwards the, the reasons for this, the military uh, campaign the mistakes, yeah. the reasons why have occupied people for decades, they still do. And the more, as it were, the other side of things at home haven't been looked at so much. I mean, in terms of suffrage, would you say World War I is the most significant period? Well, the interesting thing is when you look at what women got up to elsewhere, not, you know, they suspended the campaign for the vote in 1914 mm. when war broke out. Yeah. The interesting thing is that I hear a lot of people say in a very dismissive way, well, of course, women, you know, they did their bit during the war and they only got, uh, they only got a partial vote, women under 30 and other qualifications. Mm. You know, it wasn't really. Uh, and, you know, as a result of their, you know, the work they did for the country. Not at all. When you look at the detail, what you discover is something else. That is the dismissive thing which rather suggests that women worked so, as one of them put it after the war, one of the campaigners, it is as if a dog has performed a rather special trick and been given a biscuit for it. Now they felt very strongly that's how a lot of men wanted to see it. In fact, if you look at the war, this, I found a fascinating bit, which I did a lot of research on, mm. on the parliamentary side. Halfway through the war, the government realized that the next election uh, was going to be a big problem because most of the men who had been away fighting a long time um, were disenfranchised. 
because you had to live for a certain period at the same address. Wow. And there they were, away. And they realised that all of these fighting men were not going to have a vote. Yeah. So, right, we need to change the law about what qualifies you to vote. At which point, the suffrage campaigner said, what? <laughs> change? Yeah. Change the rules? Right. <laughs> And they seized the opportunity and they went lobbying. And all the senior people like Mrs. Fawcett and Mrs. Pankhurst were in there lobbying. Mm. And they were saying, look, you know, uh, you're going to change things. Uh, you're going to change the rules. Now, we have been campaigning. And Lloyd George, who is by then Prime Minister, was more sympathetic. Yeah. Certainly much more so than Mr. Asquith before the war. And they said, come on, come on. And it was their campaigning, which was steady right through 1917, which actually got it. Which got it. And it's interesting to see how many people wanted to merely say it was just giving a thank you for what they did. It wasn't. It was those tough women saying, come on, uh, you're changing the law. This is the opportunity. It's, a it's absolutely fascinating. I mean, I could talk about it for, <laughs> for hours, but I must finally touch on your career in reporting um, I mean you've obviously served in you know in the, probably the biggest conflict of the last 30 years I mean was this a career that you ever for, foresaw never never of course I didn't even think to have a career I come from a generation unlike yours where girls really um, uh, if they went to a nice school like mine <laughs> you know, learnt a bit of sort of um, maybe uh, cookery and nursing and useful things in order to um, you know be yeah. a housewife which is part of the legacy of our mother's generation pushed into the back into the home after World War Two, and it only dawned on me very slowly I ought to get a job <laughs> and I then didn't know what and this sounds familiar <laughs> absolute luck came around the corner after my university degree and that was a local radio station starting up part of a BBC experiment out of the blue and one started up in North East England where I was living and I thought well it sounds interesting and I sort of went along and begged them to hire me. I mean, I didn't know what I was going to do, yeah. and that's how it started. So I never had any concept no. of what I was going to do. I took what came along, and every so often I thought, hmm, that looks interesting, and had a go. Yeah. So I've been very lucky. I mean, how, how do you think journalism, reporting, broadcasting has, has changed? Massively. In the, in it would take years. us three hours to discuss Yeah, well, absolutely. It. Hugely so, and one of the things is that broadcasting, to a certain extent, reflects society. Yeah. Societies don't stand still, or usually don't, and therefore broadcasting changes as well. Mm. So one must never be surprised by the change and sort of say, well, I'm going to lie down in the road in front of this juggernaut and see, and the answer is you get run over. <laughs> so you yeah, then yeah. say, what have you actually got to change and how to change with it? And I think that's inevitable, uh, particularly with a young business like the media. Uh, it will always be on the change and you've just got to examine it and work out how to work with it. Yeah. Well, Kate Eddie, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for a terrific talk. Thank you. Thank you.